Well, please open up your Bible and find the gospel according to Mark, chapter 10. Mark, chapter 10. I want to read to you Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Hear now the words of the one true and living God. And they came to Jericho, they, Jesus and his disciples. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, Have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart. Get up. He's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up. And came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, teacher, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, Jesus, on the way. This is the holy word of God. Let's now ask the Lord to bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, how kind, how tender-hearted you are to help and to save blind beggars like us. For some of us, we can rejoice in Jesus with great praise because we were once blind, but now we see. We were once dead in sin, but now we are alive in Christ. But Lord, there are some who are still in darkness. They don't understand the gospel and they lack the desire to know Christ and believe in him. And I ask that it would please you this morning to do for the lost what you did for blind Bartimaeus. Please have mercy on them. Please call them to your son. And have mercy on us, on your church as well. Lord, strengthen our faith by your rich grace. In the name of our blessed Redeemer and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the last couple Sundays... We learned in great detail with Jesus' disciples, we learned about Jesus' breathtaking servanthood. His breathtaking servanthood, his sacrifice by which we are saved, and this all happened right on the heels of his third prediction of his own suffering and death and resurrection. Jesus deals with his self-centered disciples in such a way that it exposes their inability their helplessness, their need for Jesus. It exposes this in us as well. And it also exposes Jesus' wonderful humility, his saving servanthood. What wonderful verses we got to learn last Sunday and the Sundays before. Today, as we look at Mark 10, verses 46 through 52, we'll be learning verses that primarily orbit around the last miraculous healing that Jesus performs in the gospel according to Mark. So interestingly, following these last verses from Mark 10, Mark will primarily focus on major events and redemptive history. He's going to focus on the triumphal entry, Jesus' final teachings, both public and private, and most importantly, Jesus' betrayal, his arrest, his trial, his suffering, his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. But before we get there, by the Holy Spirit, Mark has one more miraculous healing that he wants to bring to our attention. He wants us to see the healing of blind Bartimaeus. And these last seven verses of Mark 10 can be summarized with the words, Begging and healing. Begging and healing. 
So keep that in your memory if you can, begging and healing. On a side note, there are a few important themes that come to a head in these verses. There's four of them. Let me list them to you. First of, uh, first off, uh, the identification of Jesus as the Davidic Messiah, as the Son of God, comes to fulfillment here, comes to full view here. Jesus has been clear with his disciples about this, about his identity, but here, a blind beggar is going to persistently scream it to the heavens, no matter how many times other people tell him to shut up. So, if you haven't heard so far in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is the Christ, you're going to hear it from blind Bartimaeus. Second, Jesus' compassion for the outcast, for the destitute, his power to save, all of this will be put on full display in these verses this morning. Once again, Jesus' tenderness and toughness will be highlighted by Mark as Jesus serves and saves a broken, despised outcast. And third, Mark will heighten the contrast between the spiritual insight of a blind man and the spiritual dullness of Jesus' his followers. It is quite intriguing, the contrast between the request of James and John that we just learned about a couple Sundays back, and then contrast that with uh, Bartimaeus' request. Kind of interesting. And what's also interesting is the way that Jesus responds to both James and John and how he responds to Bartimaeus here. And fourth, lastly, before Jesus suffers and dies on the cross, before he rises from the dead as our Savior, Mark wants to point out once again that Jesus has the credentials. He has the qualities that the Lord promised his anointed one would have. Let's listen to the prophets speak. God said this through his prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 6 and verse 10. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singings. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. My friends, there are many more places in the prophets where they speak just like this. They speak just like this about the work of the Messiah. The Lord's anointed one promised to come and to save. They talk just like this. And here, in Mark 10, verses 46 through 52, our passage this morning, the renewal of the blind man's sight is a powerful symbol of the promised restoration that the Messiah will, in fact, bring when he comes to save his people. So, those are the four important themes that Mark kind of brings to a head in our passage this morning. And with that said, join me in verses 46 through 48. I want you to think of this section of verses as the beggar's situation and request. So the beggar's situation and request, the scriptures say this, and they came to Jericho, and as he, Jesus, was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. What I want you to notice first is the first comment that Mark makes about Jesus' arrival into Jericho. What you must know is that Jesus, of course accompanied by his disciples, a sizable crowd, they're traveling to Jerusalem through Jericho as we read from Mark 10, 32 and 33. They're going to Jerusalem, and Jericho is on the way. Jericho is some 18 to 17 miles northeast of Jerusalem, and it was customary at that time for distinguished rabbis to travel with an entourage and to teach on the way, which Jesus is doing. 
And it was customary at that time for many to travel through Jericho to reach Jerusalem for the Passover. And oh yeah, you should probably know about the Passover. The Passover is very close. The Passover was a special event, a holy convocation, where God commanded his people to gather together, have a special meal, and this meal is to help them to remember the events of the Exodus, where the Lord rescued his people from their enemy out of Egyptian slavery by a mighty and outstretched arm. The Lord did so by many miracles. How interesting how Jesus is going to the cross to accomplish a far greater exodus, isn't he? And he's performing a miracle here. So not only are Jesus and his disciples on the road to Jerusalem, but so are many other Jews. By the way, Jericho is an oasis in the Judean desert. The city itself is very old. The Lord caused his people to defeat and capture the enemies of Joshua. By this time during the days of Jesus, it surely is a beautiful city. It's a beautiful city because it recently was refurbished by the Herodian family. It was their choice venue for their magnificent winter palace, and it was nicknamed the City of Roses. And so, Jesus and many others are basically a day's journey away from Jerusalem. Jesus and his disciples are passing through Jericho to get to Jerusalem. Massive hordes of people are now traveling together, hoping to get a glimpse at Jesus, the famous preacher and healer. And this is where we meet Bartimaeus. This is where Bartimaeus comes to the picture. As Jesus, his disciples, and a great crowd are exiting the city, there is this passageway that they are squeezing through. And this just so happens to be where Bartimaeus is sitting by the roadside. Now we're told that Bartimaeus is a blind beggar, so he's unable to see. He's unable to see, therefore unable to work. So his only chance for survival is to beg for food and money. And since he is begging, that is a good indication that he has, he either has no relative able to support him, or he has no relative willing to support him. So he's, he turns to the generosity of strangers. And if you're going to survive off the generosity of strangers. you got to pick a good place to meet a lot of strangers, right? Well, roadside, exiting Jericho, and the direction of Jerusalem is a prime location. Why? Well, many Levitical priests will travel this way to get to Jerusalem, as well as many religious-minded folks who are more willing to give to strangers. So there are reasons behind why Bartimaeus picked his spot. It's a good spot, and I'm sure a lot of other beggars were with Bartimaeus in that spot. Now, Bartimaeus is described as a blind beggar sitting by the roadside, and he's described as the son of Timaeus, which, by the way, is the Greek translation of the name Bartimaeus. So Bartimaeus is Aramaic for son of Timaeus. So, surprise. Um, Really no more details than that. Now, Mark may have mentioned Bartimaeus by name, Because Bartimaeus was known to his original audience. That could be true. So Mark might be writing this letter that we're reading today, but the original audience actually had a firsthand experience with Bartimaeus, and that's why he mentions them by name. Or, what's very likely, is that Bartimaeus became somewhat famous in the church for being miraculously healed by Jesus, and because he became a devout follower of Christ following his healing. That's probably more likely. Now, to this point, for these verses, the following verses really to have their intended effect on us, we have to try and relive this moment from Bartimaeus' perspective. So try if you can. With the help of Kent Hughes, I'm going to try to help you imagine what it would be like to be in his shoes and his situation. So the day began probably like any other day for blind Bartimaeus. He probably woke up, brushed off the straw from his shabby, torn garment. He may have stretched a little bit, carefully got to his feet, and then began tapping his way along the familiar turns that led to the main gate in Jericho. Perhaps he was able to beg for a crust of bread or two at some familiar stops along the way. 
And then arriving at the gate, he took his regular place with the other beggars. For he drew his greasy cloak tight around him because though it's spring, it takes a little bit of time for the sun to dispel the chill in the air. And what does he do? He sits there, just like so many days before. He listens to the city wake up and come to life. Maybe he hears a donkey loaded with fruit for the market pass by him. Maybe several women chatting as they bore pitchers or going to the well. Maybe he hears the sound of camels coming or approaching, or maybe leaving. Possibly he can smell the marketplace as Jericho begins humming with life. But suddenly, Bartimaeus is alerted to something. He lifts his head, trying to make sense out of the sound coming his way. It's kind of strange. It's kind of unique. So he strains to hear. It's a great crowd approaching with a multitude of conversations and a multitude of footsteps. First, maybe some young boys run past him, having fun. Then he notices that the road that he's sitting beside is just packed with travelers. And they seem to be excited, and so he keeps listening. He's trying to make sense out of what's happening, and he keeps being brushed by the robes of the travelers because there must be so many people on this roadway that they're even pushed toward him. And so as he's brushed by these robes, he stretches out his hand to grab a robe of a passerby. And after successfully grabbing a robe... The passerby yanks it away from Bartimaeus, but not before Bartimaeus is able to ask this question. What's happening? And the stranger answers him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth, the one who heals the lame, lepers, and deaf, and blind, the one who confounds the scribes and says that he's the son of man, the divine son of man, the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth, he's passing by. Bartimaeus knows the name. He's heard it before. Jesus is the talk of the town. Everyone has been talking about Jesus' words and Jesus' works. Maybe Bartimaeus had a conversation with a person who had a firsthand experience of Jesus' miraculous healing powers. And so Bartimaeus, his heart starts thumping, his thoughts start racing. This must be the Messiah. This must be the Messiah. And this Jesus, he could be close enough to hear my voice. And though the warm sun is surely shining at this moment, Bartimaeus begins to tremble at the thought that he could be healed this morning. And he's hearing more and more people pass by. And though Bartimaeus, though his world is busy, he just sees darkness. People are calling to one another, maybe even at this point even saying some hosannas, shouting it. Maybe Bartimaeus is jolted by the noise. He's thinking Jesus may soon be out of range. I have to do something. I have to do something. This could be the day. I have to do something. And just as Mark tells us in verse 47, Bartimaeus breaks his silence and begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus is desperate. He's frantic. He's trying his hardest to make himself heard as he's sitting there on the roadside. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, feeble Bartimaeus knows that his outbursts aren't welcomed. We're told in verse 48, many rebuked him. They told him to be silent. But as it says, he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So there he is shouting as people are shushing him. Some may even be rebuking him with insults. He's calling out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Shut up, beggar. Son of David, have mercy on me. Will someone stop him? And at this point, it just doesn't matter what they called him. It doesn't matter what they threatened to do it to him. Blind Bart was not going to turn down the volume, and he wasn't going to stop now. But if we could turn down the volume for a moment and reflect on what was implicit in Bartimaeus' cries, 
I think we'll see that the Lord had been merciful to him already. And I think we'll see that Bartimaeus' cries were going to get him everything. Everything. So first, Bartimaeus was pitifully aware of his condition. Think with me, my friends. He lived in perpetual darkness. From his mother's womb to that day was darkness. His world that he dwelt in, darkness. He never ever experienced trees waving in the spring wind. He never saw the blue summer sky. He never saw his own mother's face. He, doesn't, he hasn't even seen anyone that he has loved. But unlike many even today who perpetually live in spiritual darkness, Bartimaeus knew what his problem was. He was aware of his need. He was aware of his helplessness. He was aware of his problem. Yehiel Denner a principal witness at the Nuremberg War Crime Trials in 1961, Yehiel Deneur came face to face with Adolf Eichmann for the first time since being sent to Auschwitz almost 20 years earlier. And Adolf Eichmann, if you don't know, he was a major, one of the major organizers of the Holocaust. He facilitated and managed the logistics that involved the mass deportation of Jews to extermination camps for the Nazis during World War II. Eichmann did things that we easily can say, we easily talk about as unthinkable. During 1961, during that trial, Eichmann enters the courtroom, and Yehiel Deneur saw the man who sent him to Auschwitz, and Deneur began sobbing uncontrollably. He sobbed to the point that he fainted. And the judge, the presiding judge, is just pounding his gavel for order. What? Why the reaction? Why that response? Was he that filled with hate? Was he, was he that scared? What was it that drove him to uncontrollably sob and then faint? Well, later in an interview, Deneur explained the meaning behind his reaction. Deneur explained that all at once he realized that Eichmann was not like this demon army officer who had sent so many to their deaths. This Eichmann was an ordinary man. And as Deneur would say, I was afraid about myself. I saw that I am capable of this. I am exactly like him. And here's how one famous interviewer summarized Deneur's discovery. He said, Eichmann is in all of us. Eichmann is in all of us. My friends, when you realize, when you realize how sinful you are, you will want to sob uncontrollably and faint, just like Yehiel Deneur did when he met Adolf Eichmann. It is a devastating experience to truly confront the sin that is within your own heart. And yet, this devastating experience is an experience that brings grace. This is why Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, Matthew 5, 4. Bartimaeus' pitiful cries for mercy came from a profound clarity of self-understanding, and it brought grace. That's the first thing I want you to catch. Second, Bartimaeus' pitiful cries for mercy display penetrating insight into the person of Jesus Christ. Bartimaeus addressed Jesus as the son of David because Bartimaeus must have known his scriptures because the Messiah, the Savior to come, was promised to come from the line of David. Bartimaeus may have been blind, but he had an acute awareness of Jesus' identity as the Messiah, as the promised Son of David and Lord of David, who alone can save God's people from their sins. He was blind, but yet he saw. He had blind insight. That's the second thing. Third, Bartimaeus, his pitiful cries reveal his amazing, passionate persistence. Bartimaeus didn't care if the crowd rejected him. He didn't care if the crowd rejected him. Bartimaeus just wanted Jesus' acceptance and mercy. 
He didn't care what he would have to give up in order to get it. He just wanted it. His urgency, his persistence, these are good examples of what ought to be true of our faith in Jesus. And something that sticks out is that Bartimaeus cried out like a helpless infant, didn't he? He cried out like a helpless infant, and we know what Jesus says about childlike faith. We learned it. Mark 10, 15, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Well, Bartimaeus certainly received the kingdom of God like a child, didn't he? He was crying out just like a helpless infant. He had childlike faith, not childish faith. He had childlike faith. All that God offers sinners in Christ belongs only to those who go for it. Hear me. Listen to me closely here. The Lord extends through his Son gifts that we can't even imagine the value. But it only belongs to those who go for it. And Bartimaeus went for it, didn't he? As Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6. So, this is verses 46 through 48. This is the beggar's situation. This is his request. I hope that you see something insightful from blind Bart here. He had self-knowledge that by God's grace, God gives through his word. He had knowledge about the identity of Jesus, and he was persistent as a helpless infant, wasn't he? Now, I want us to turn to verses 49 through 52. Think of this section as Jesus' call and the beggar's response. Probably the easiest way to remember it. Jesus' call and the beggar's response. The verses say, Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man and saying to him, take heart. Get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Verse 49 is one of the most amazing verses in chapter 10. And there's a lot of them in chapter 10. Verse 49, in it, Mark records that Jesus stopped and called Bartimaeus. Remember, Jesus is on his way to terrible suffering and the cross. Just 18 miles or so away in Jerusalem is where he's heading. And yet Jesus pauses. He makes time for a blind beggar. That's, true. That's still true today, by the way, in a far more excellent fashion. From the right hand of the majesty on high, Jesus is instantly attentive to all our cries, even when a million of us beggars cry out to him at once. He notices, he hears, and he cares. And notice that it says that Jesus commanded the crowd to summon Bartimaeus. That's a turn of events. That's a wild turn of events. By Jesus' sovereign power, by his unparalleled authority, Jesus transforms the crowd from a blockade in Bartimaeus' way into a cheerful path that leads right to Jesus. He turned the crowd into evangelizers by a command. And did you notice what the members of the crowd said to Bartimaeus? Take heart. Be of good cheer, or as we would say, it's going to be okay. Hey, it's going to be okay. Get up. Get up. He's calling for you. No sweeter words did Bartimaeus ever hear. I've got good news. Everything is going to be okay. Jesus is calling you. Jesus, the healing Messiah, wants you to come to him. Get up and go to him. Get up and go. And what did Bartimaeus do? Look at his response in verse 50. He threw away his cloak. That's an extreme gesture. That's a very extreme gesture for a poor blind man to do. Well, 
It's extreme because he probably doesn't own another garment. It's kind of risky to throw away your only garment. But also, since he's blind, you normally want to keep things within reach, within your touch, so that you don't lose it. And he's on a roadside among, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, where one could easily lose a garment if it gets out of your reach and you're blind. He throws that away. Why? I don't, not this time. I don't care about my garment because Jesus is summoning me. That's what I care about. So he springs up and he stumbles his way to Jesus with the help of others. Just try and imagine the joy that was painted across Bartimaeus' face. It's kind of like those times where you see those videos of when a military member shows up out of nowhere to surprise his family. And they see him, and they just can't stop crying, and they, they can't let him go. It's like that. And here they stand. Jesus, the all-seeing Savior, and Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, they stand toe-to-toe, and nose to nose. And in verse 51, there is this quick exchange between them. Jesus said to blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Does that sound familiar? What do you want me to do for you? Sounds a lot like what he said to James and John, right? And the blind man said to Jesus, rabbi or teacher, let me recover my sight. And then in verse 52, it happens. It happens. The impossible actually happens. And Jesus said to Bartimaeus, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately, let me stress it again, immediately when Jesus spoke the words, instantaneously he recovered his sight. And what does he do after recovering his sight? And followed Jesus on the way. My friends, we just saw this hopeless beggar given a saving hope in Christ. We saw the helpless was helped. The unhealable was healed. And he was healed without surgery, without bandages, no adjustments, no follow-up appointments, just instantaneous results. A blind man's sight was restored, and a sinner was saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, pause and think, What have we learned today? Well, believers, I think we should should probably evangelize like that crowd eventually did to Bartimaeus. I think we should probably be walking around saying, take heart, get up. Jesus is calling you. He commands you to come. He commands you to repent and believe in him. Get up and go to him. Rise and go. Run to Jesus. Rest in Jesus. Jesus is calling. He's saying, I'm inviting you to come to me. I have forgiveness. I have transforming grace. I have promises. Come. Come. You want salvation? Come to me. You want satisfaction? Come to me. I have what no one else can buy. Come to me. Are you thirsty? Come. I'll quench your thirst. I think we should probably evangelize like that, like the crowd did to Bartimaeus. Unbelievers, I think it's pretty obvious that you need the Holy Spirit to do a work in your heart, to illuminate the eyes of your heart so that you can see the depths of your sin and your helplessness. If you still think that you're able to save yourself, you don't really know how sinful you are. You'll never see your need for grace unless you see that you have no way of earning it. And what are such people to do, people who see their their, their sin and their helplessness plainly. What are those kind of people to do when they realize that they need help, that they're sinful, that they are hopeless in and of themselves? What should they do? They should cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. That's a really good prayer. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus calls you through his gospel, and the Holy Spirit effectually gets you to come and stumble your way to him, here's what you should say to Jesus. Lord, please take away my darkness and sin. Give me life in Christ. Give me life, please. Cry out to him and ask 
for your greatest need to be met. Unbeliever, that's what I think you should have learned. And I pray that the Spirit would work upon your heart, that you'd see and believe. You'd see and savor the Lord Jesus Christ as Bartimaeus did. That you would care only about his acceptance, not what others might think. Take that to heart, believers, as well. How often do you give a godlike status to the acceptance and approval of others? I'm worried what they might think. Who cares what they think? Who cares what they think, and who cares what you think about yourself? The Lord is judge, and only the Lord can justify. Heavenly Father, you are so rich in mercy. You have loved us with a great love. O oh Lord, we praise you. Thank you for the ministry and life of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for preserving for us the account of this miracle. Thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit, opening blind eyes to see and to savor Jesus, our majestic and only Redeemer. Lord, please say, please have mercy on those who are spiritually blind beggars, Lord. Cause your people to rejoice. Cause them to realize that they have received a healing that can't be matched by anything else in all this world. All glory to your name. In Christ's holy name, amen.